Good afternoon, everybody. I think we need to try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, much better. And Laurel, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. That's very sweet of you. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. We have so much I want to cover. I want to dive right in. We're talking about unconscious bias and how to tackle its effects in work, in life, and at school. So let's start with a quick 30-second exercise. I'd love for you to take out a pen and pencil and write down your personal definition of unconscious bias. And if you have no idea what it is at this moment, that's OK, because we're going to learn together. You've got 25 seconds to go. All right. It looks like most of you have it. Hold on to it. We'll come back to that definition in a minute. But first, the checkerboard. Take a close look at squares A and B and determine, please, if you will, what color they are. And then keep a close look on squares A and B as I cover up the rest of the checkerboard. And now what color are they? Let me go back to convince you that I didn't play a trick on you. In fact, it's your own brain playing a trick on itself. This right here is unconscious bias in action. Our brains are bombarded by about 11 million of pieces of information every single second. And only 40 of those pieces of information are processed consciously. The vast majority of all the information that we're taking in is processed unconsciously. And normally, that's not a problem, because our unconscious mind gets it right a lot of the time. But our unconscious mind is exceptionally susceptible to pattern-based thinking, such as with this checkerboard right here. In order not to get completely overwhelmed, and in order to make decisions in a reasonable amount of time, our brain develops shortcuts. It resorts to patterns to make sense of everything that's happening. These shortcuts are based on our past experiences, our beliefs, but also things in the environment, like the news stories that you look at, the pictures you see in the media, the books that were read to you as a kid, the news articles that you read or the textbooks that you read in school. What happens here with this particular checkerboard is that your brain very quickly recognizes the applicable pattern. That's the light square next to the dark square. It takes into it, your brain takes into account the shadow cast by the green object, and then decides that square A has to be darker than square B which, of course, in this case, turns out not to be the case because they're the same color. The other important fact about unconscious bias that this checkerboard illustrates is that even once you're aware of being biased, even when you know you have it, you can't help yourself, right? Most of you looking at this now will still see square A as being darker than square B, even though I already proved to you that they're the same color. I certainly do, too. We'll return to this idea, but that's very important to recognize, is awareness alone is not enough in overcoming the effects of bias. So that's one example. Now let's do a really fun one. And I'm going to need everyone to participate for this one. We'll do a practice round first. I'm going to show you six words, and I want you to speak out loud the color that the words are written in. It doesn't matter what the letters say. I want you to tell me the color that the words are written in. And you read as you normally would, left to right, top to bottom. You're going to go at your own pace. Everyone's going to be speaking out loud. Go as fast as you can. Don't worry about your neighbor. Are you ready? Here we go. This is a trial run. Awesome. I think we got this. That was a trial run. Same thing, but I'm going to show you a few more words. Are you ready? Let's go. Awesome. I'm going to ask you to do that just one more time. Same instructions. Please tell me the color that the word is written in. Here we go. Uh-oh. <laughs> what happened? I'll tell you what I observed. As a group, the first time around when the letters corresponded to the colors, it took you about 10 seconds to get through the 16 words. The second round, where I disassociated the letters and the colors, right? 
it took you twice as long, about 21 seconds. Our brain, those patterns, those unconscious biases that we all have, one form in which they come is associations. When you think pink, you think P-I-N-K, but you also think of the color pink. So when I show you the word pink written in the color pink, it makes sense. That's, that's the two things that your brain puts together. But when you see the word green written in the color pink, your brain has to work a lot harder to figure out what's going on. And we have these types of unconscious associations, not just between words and colors, but also between things like men work in leadership, or women, children, nurturing, and home. A lot of these associations we absorb at a very young age from our environments, from our context, both in the homes that we grow up, but also broader society. So I want to give you an example um, of what this looks like in the workplace very shortly. But before I do, this is an example of an implicit association test. So if you're interested in doing more tests like this, it's available for free online. It's been taken by millions of people around the world. The test was originally developed by psychologist Majorin Banaji at Harvard about 20 years ago. But if you do take more of these tests, you're bound to discover that like most people who have taken them over the course of the years, you are sexist, you are racist, you are biased in various terrible ways. Our brains are nowhere near as objective and as good at decision making as we think they are. So here's that example I promised about bias and how it manifests itself in the workplace. I'd like you to meet Heidi Roizen. Heidi is an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley in California. And she's the protagonist of a case study that was written about her by a colleague of mine, Kathleen McGinn, at the Harvard Business School. This case is used with business school students to teach them about effective management and effective leadership. And it talks about how Heidi built her career um, and became very successful at investing in entrepreneurial ventures. Where things get very interesting is that a couple of years after the original case, some colleagues at the Columbia Business School took the case about Heidi Roizen and gave it to their students in two batches. The first half of the students got the original case with Heidi's name on it. The second batch of students got the exact same case study, but Heidi's name was replaced by Howard. They gave the cases to the students, they read them, and then the students answered a questionnaire about their perceptions of Heidi and Howard. And you might be able to guess where I'm going with this, because here is what they found. The students actually found Heidi and Howard to be equally competent, which is not that surprising because they're the same person doing the same thing. However, they systematically found Heidi much less likable. They found her to be more power hungry, more self-promoting, and more disingenuous than Howard. This is an example of one of those unconscious, implicit associations that we talked about. I see a lot of you nodding in the audience. Our stereotype of an entrepreneur or, or of a venture capitalist is a white man. So Heidi doesn't look the part or act the part. In fact, by being a very aggressive networker and a masterful negotiator, she actively violates our stereotypes, our expectations about a woman, what a woman is and what a woman does. We simply do not use the same measuring stick for measuring women's and men's behavior. What in Howard people perceived as ambition and vision and drive in Heidi was self-promotion, inauthenticity, aggression. That is gender bias in action. And I know that many of you might have already experienced this in your life. Even if you haven't, I don't tell you this to discourage you. But I think it's very important for us to be totally honest about what the dynamics are and what the challenges that we need to overcome. Part of where gender bias and unconscious bias in general comes from is the fact that seeing is believing. A lot of our leaders, for example, historically have been men, at least the ones that we always hear about. So it's somewhat natural for our minds to develop an association between men and between leadership. But then the existence of that stereotype makes it harder going forward for women to attain leadership positions which would allow us to update our biases and to change the stereotypes. So it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem. Seeing is believing. We've heard this a couple times earlier today in different words, but 
what we are exposed to in terms of symbols, role models, visuals, language is incredibly powerful. And for that reason, I want to turn to four specific strategies that I hope all of you will take with you and implement in life, in school, and at work to help tackle the effects of unconscious bias. Notice that I don't say tackle unconscious bias itself. Because an overwhelming body of research suggests that these biases are ingrained into our brains at a very early age, and by the time we're in this room today, it's impossible to eliminate that, the bias that you already have in your brain. However, it is possible to change the systems and the environments that we live in to make small little tweaks to enable our inherently biased minds to make better decisions. Remember the white rectangles that we put on the checkerboard that liberated your mind from the pattern and allowed you to see squares A and B for what they really are? Yes, that's an example of a small, simple, very low cost tweak in the environment that doesn't change the inherent biases you have in your brain but changes your decisions, changes your behavior because you're able to look past the bias and make better decisions. So here's my first intervention to you, and this one is about language. Here's an example of a job advertisement for a kindergarten teacher, and it reads, looking for a warm and caring teacher with exceptional pedagogical and interpersonal skills to work in a supportive, collaborative work environment. Notice that I bold and ad italicized a couple of those words. Why do you think? It turns out language is not gender neutral. We've identified through research specific sets of words that in our culture we associate with other women or men. Words like warm, caring, nurturing, family oriented, in our minds are female typed. Words like individualistic, leadership, ninja, aggressive, in our brains are male typed. But it goes beyond that. It turns out that the language that you use in a job advertisement actually impacts who is going to apply for the job. A language like a job advertisement like this that has heavily female type language is actually disproportionately going to attract women to apply for this job posting. So sometimes without even realizing, we're excluding, we're limiting our talent pool. We're excluding people before we've even really started our recruitment process. One intervention that can help combat gendered language is simply to get rid of it. In this case, they could have replaced this job ad with looking for an excellent teacher with exceptional pedagogical skills. So that's one option. Another option is to balance the language that you're using. So if you want to put in some of those female typed words, like nurturing and warm and team oriented, you might balance those out by including some male typed words to create an overall gender balanced job description. And by the way, this doesn't apply only to job descriptions. Gendered language pops up everywhere. It pops up in the essays you write, in the newspaper articles that you read, when you're writing a cover letter for yourself, or maybe you're writing a recommendation letter for somebody else. So I urge you to be on the lookout for gendered language. Fix it when you see it. Um, and by the way, there's freely available tools online, both lists of words of what's female typed and male typed in our culture, but also tools where you can copy and paste in text and it'll highlight any of your biased, gender biased language for you. So language truly affects behavior. The other thing that truly affects behavior is role models. And I don't mean just mentorship and sponsorship, sort of human role models, which are of course incredibly important, but I also mean symbols. Things like the pictures on your walls. This Star Trek picture refers to a study that Sapna Charian, uh, a professor at the University of Washington, conducted in computer science classrooms. She went in and replaced the existing Star Wars pictures, believe it or not, this is so stereotypical, but they actually had Star Wars pictures in this computer science classroom, and she replaced them with gender neutral na nature and art landscapes. And that simple change, she found, significantly increased girls' association of women with computer science careers. So once again, seeing is believing. 
the messages, the visuals, the role models that you're exposed to make a huge difference in your behavior subconsciously. When I talk about symbols, yes, it's pictures on the walls, but it's also the names of the conference rooms in your office. It's the pictures that you have on recruiting brochures or on your company's website. It's the people that you choose to feature in your annual holiday video, if your company makes one. It's the people whose work is highlighted at school when there's a showcase or an opportunity for people to volunteer to talk about the project that they've done. All of these instances of symbols of role models have a huge effect on our behavior. So that's my second intervention for you, is watch out for the pictures and change them today. I can't resist sharing a very quick anecdote about the power of role models, and this one comes from Finland, um, where the country's first female president, Tarja Halonen, and she's in the bottom right corner there, served from 2000 to 2012. And a couple years into her tenure, into her time in office, she visited a kindergarten classroom in Finland. She was asking the kids what they wanted to do when they grow up, and she was getting all the typical answers you'd expect, actress, doctor, firefighter. And then she asked one of the little boys, who was about five, well, wouldn't you want to grow up and be president like me? And the boy looked up at her wide-eyed and said, but in this country, boys can't be president. So after just a few years of a woman in office, in the highest office of the land, you had a new generation of kids growing up whose default assumption was the presidents of course are female. That's the power of seeing is believing and that's the power of role models. Next, I want to talk to you about the bias that lives in our systems and our processes. We started by talking about the bias that's inherent in our minds, and that's unfortunately very difficult to change and eliminate. But on some level, the good news is that the bias that lives in our systems and in our processes is actually very easy and oftentimes simple to change. This example refers to the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or the SAT, which some of you may have heard of. It's a very important standardized test that uh, many American high school students have to take in order to apply to college, to university. And the SAT used to be scored in such a way that you got one point for a correct answer, zero points if you skipped a question, and you got a quarter point deduction for a wrong answer. A colleague of mine at Harvard, Katie Baldiga Coffin, now a professor at Harvard Business School, started looking into SAT scores and she found that women, girls, were getting slightly lower scores than boys, which doesn't make any sense because we know that generally girls tend to do better in school and we don't assume that intelligence and ability is any less this, there's any less of it in girls than there is in boys. So Katie dug in deeper and she found that in fact, girls and boys answered a different number of questions on the test. Girls, if they didn't know the answer, if they weren't certain of their answer, were much less willing to throw in a wild guess than boys were, which led them to overall answer a lower number of questions on the text. Now the boys who were guessing wildly, of course sometimes they got it wrong and they got the quarter point deduction, but at times they also got it right. And that overall led them to scoring higher on the test. This particular story has a really happy ending because um, as a result of the research, the SAT was recently redesigned and the new version of the test that launched last year now is scored such that a correct answer will get you a point and a wrong answer will get you zero points. The penalty for guessing has been taken out. And the criticism that was leveled at the time they announced the new test was that this would make the test kind of useless going forward in terms of predicting people's or signaling people's ability because it would just encourage rampant wild guessing. To which the answer, of course, has to be that we were encouraging rampant wild guessing all along just from half of the population. So that's the SAT. My, my take home message to you here is that whenever you see a gender gap, whenever you see a difference between men and women, whether it's in grades or the number of women that get hired, the number of women that get promoted, that's a sign that there is a biased system operating underneath that's driving those gender gaps. And it's your job to ask questions, to dig deeper, and keep looking until you find the source of that bias and eliminate it to close that gender gap. Lastly, my beach slide. This is a very popular one. So tell me, 
which one would you be more likely, which beach would you be more likely to drop a piece of trash on? The left beach or the right beach? The left, obviously, right? But why is that? This, this slide is all about social norms. And when I say social norms, I mean the expectations of what kind of behavior is accepted and tolerated. The norms around behavior on these two beaches are very different. You go on the left beach, and you can immediately tell that a ton of people have been dropping trash there all along. It's clearly OK, and no one's going to call you out for it if you do it. So maybe if you drop a piece of trash, you don't feel that bad about it, because everyone else does it too. The social norms that are in place on the right beach are totally different. Not only is it very clear that littering is not allowed and littering is not expected, but if you were to drop a piece of trash on this beach, you would actually feel a little bit bad about it inside. And who knows, someone might even come up to you and call you out on what you just did. These social norms and the dirty beach, clean beach dynamic apply very much in our daily lives and in our interactions with other people. Think about your team, your organization, a group that you recently were working with on something together. Was that team a dirty beach environment or was that team a clean beach environment? If someone interrupted another person, how did everyone else react? Was that OK, par for the course? If someone dropped a sexist or racist or insensitive joke, is that just, that's what we do on the beach? Or did people call that out? And did they say, hey, that's not OK behavior in this environment. We're not going to stand up for this. The term that we like to use for this in the academic literature is norm entrepreneurship. As, an entrepreneur, as a norm entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur in general, you're someone who takes personal responsibility for creating the world that you want to see. If you want to live on a clean beach, it's your job to interrupt the interrupters, to not let people get away with offensive jokes, to not let people get away with stealing other people's ideas. Where Jane said something five minutes ago, and now that John mentions it, everyone thinks it's John's idea, and he's the biggest genius in the world. No, that was actually Jane's idea, and she needs to get credit for it. And you need to make sure that she gets credit for it. So that's my fourth intervention to you, is to become a norm entrepreneur, and in every single interaction that you have in your life, to make sure that you are creating the type of inclusive, gender equal, respectful world that we all want to see. So let me leave you with a couple of thoughts about the power that we as individuals have to shape things. Whether you're on the side of applying to organizations and entering the workforce, or whether you're on the side of already being um, an employee of an organization, maybe an employer in the sense that you're actually hiring people in, you have more power than you think in changing some of these bias structures that we operate in. In other words, in helping to tackle and overcome the negative effects of unconscious bias. These first two pictures are about hiring and recruitment. If you're coming into an organization, what kind of signal does it send to you if all the people that interview you are white men? I think it's worth thinking about and I think it's also worth asking, is this an organization that I want to join? What kind of environment is this organization going to be once I'm inside? Is it going to be a clean beach or is it going to be a dirty beach? Is this going to be a place where my voice is going to be listened to and I'm going to have a genuine ability to bring my contributions and my best talents forward and make a difference? Or am I the odd one out, the token woman or indigenous person or LGBTQ individual who's just kind of here because we had to hire a woman, but we don't really have to listen to her. And if you're on the employer side of things, are you taking advantage of the latest research and the best practices to hire in the most unbiased way possible? Are you taking people's names and addresses off of their resumes and genuinely evaluating people's resumes based on their competencies and not based on their demographic characteristics? Are you conducting structured interviews one-on-one, -on -one, not three-on-one -on -one like in the picture, so that if in, um, interviewers develop genuinely independent assessments of the candidate's abilities? These are just a couple of small things that you can do, and I'll share with you shortly a resource that contains a lot more information. 
I also want to talk about organizational culture and pay. Once again, if you're on the side of entering an organization and thinking about what kind of company you want to join, well, what are they telling you about their culture? Are they publishing their workforce metrics around diversity? Are they setting targets? Are they making public commitments around what they want their workforce and their culture to look like? Do they pay people equally? Do they check internally whether they're paying people equally? And then do they talk about it? These are all signals for finding organizations that are genuinely committed to making their workplaces as inclusive and as gender bias free as possible. On the employer side, my advice to you is do track your metrics, measure everything that you can, find gender gaps where they exist, dig deep to find the bias sources of those gaps, and then fix those processes. And then share your successes and your failures. Tell us what you did and what worked and what didn't, so that the rest of us can learn and set better goals and more quickly change our organizations and our processes. And if you're an employer, please make sure that you're paying your workforce equally. That's not a one-time thing. If you conduct a pay audit and you discover gaps and you fix them today, you need to go right back in six months and in 12 months and 18 months and do it again because these pay gaps have a tendency to crop back up. So just to briefly summarize the four plus one interventions that we discussed, beware gendered language. Be a role model yourself Encourage other people to be a role model and harness the powers, power of symbols and pictures. These are the pictures on your, on your walls as well as everywhere else because seeing is believing. Challenge processes, ask questions, find the sources of gender bias, and become a norm entrepreneur. And then it's upon all of us, incumbent upon all of us together to hold our organizations, companies, nonprofits, but also our government accountable when they don't quite meet the high expectations that we set for them and that they set for themselves. So I promise to give you a resource. My colleague at Harvard, Iris Bennett, has written a fantastic book called What Works? Gender Equality by Design. And this is two, almost 300 pages full of the types of interventions that I only alluded to and scratched the surface with you on in terms of how to create gender balanced organizations, how to de-bias your organizational processes, how to build a culture of inclusion. So if you're inspired, if you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend the book as a resource. And as we transition into questions and answers, I ask you to go back to Slido, and based on what we've talked about today, write down one action that you commit to doing to tackle the effects of unconscious bias in your life, in your work, or at school. Something that you will do differently or start doing tomorrow to build the world that we want to live in. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you so much. So Thanks. First of all, would you like to sit on? I'm happy here. Okay. Thanks. Well, well, that was amazing, Siri. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely incredible. And you know, I'm uh, I'm like Philip with a professional services organization. So I'm with Ernst and Young, and we have. A, a stable of racehorses. All we have is talent. All we have are people. And so as leaders, our job is really to nurture that talent and to develop that talent. And so about 15 years ago, we recognized in our firm, as it is everywhere else, m the massive dilemma that unconscious bias was creating for us because we'd had run the course of the diversity programs. And I think um, diversity and inclusiveness programs, and we tried everything, and we had mentorship, and we'd done all of those things. And I love the stat. I think in the U.S., they've spent eight billion dollars on DNI programs a year. Yep. And have we seen? Uh, you know, it's hardly turned the dial, right? Yep. So I think you're tackling exactly the right place. And we've certainly worked with Harvard, and we've worked with the the Bias Interrupters Group. And the way that we see 
the unconscious biases is that we all have them, of course, but they particularly show themselves under stress and pressure when we're having to make decisions under stress and pressure. And so looking <coughs> at, um, we've looked at our programs, our recruitment programs, our, our discussions around talent, the round tables we have, the promotion processes, and we've tried to interrupt you know, the biases that we know that are there rather than try to just make them all go away because that just seems like an impossible job, right? And, and we're seeing tremendous benefits from it. So um, keep up the good work. So we're going to have a bunch of questions and I'm going to just sort of give the audience a minute or so to get your questions in, but I'm going to get the ball rolling. So, so when I look around this group, and I've been so inspired by the youth energy in the room, so call it out for the girls. Um, and, and I am so encouraged by the impact that they're going to have um, on our businesses and organizations going forward. And I'm wondering, in your research, this millennial force that we're seeing and the different value sets and the different preferences that they have and the different kinds of decisions that they make, what are you thinking, what are you seeing, what's your research telling you in terms of what this next upcoming generation is going to have in terms of unconscious bias because they're certainly disrupting every other part of our ecosystem yeah. and I'm wondering whether there's going to be an impact that we could foresee on 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 these biases and I'm just wondering yeah. what your thoughts are on that I think it's a great question um, given that seeing is believing and given that most of us have been subjected to the same social conditioning in terms of the context the media the messages I think the but inherent cognitive biases that the millennials have are not different from the biases that a 50-year-old or a 70-year-old would have. Yeah. I think the big difference is that millennials are culturally much more willing to ask for more in organizations. They demand things like paid parental leave, more vacation time, ability to work more flexibly, whether that's shifting around your hours, working from home, working on the go, whatever it is. And so I think, and I think that's incredibly welcome. I mean, I think um, employees have been li living under a bit of tyranny from their employees in a lot of places for quite a while. Yeah. So I think that's the big change. Um, of course, the more we can accommodate individuals in various yeah. ways, the more we allow everyone to contribute their talents to yeah. the fullest. Yeah. And that is one solution to the talent dilemma. Okay, well that's fabulous. Um, I'm gonna throw out another question and then I'm gonna turn it over to the audience. So I think we were either gonna Put the questions in electronically or raise your hands, but one way or the other, we're going to get your thoughts. So get your questions ready out there. Um, so again, um, when you look out there, because you've had the chance to study all sorts of organizations around the world, um, recognizing that we're not at perfect yet, um, but who inspires you out there? Like, who can we look at? Because we need role models as organizations to look to, just the way that we need role models as, as people growing up. So who would you look to to say they're at least getting this mostly right, partly right, or who, who inspires you out there? Yeah. The first this thing issue? I would say to that is I wish that all organizations were much more willing to share, as I mentioned earlier, both their successes and their failures in terms of the types of things that they've tried to genuinely move the needle on diversity and inclusion. One of the things that I struggle with is when I work with organizations, they always want it to be confidential. I can't write about it. I can't talk about it. We do this work internally, but we can't share it. Um, and so that would be my first comment, mm -hmm. is I hope that organizations will get bolder um, in sharing and allowing the rest of, us, rest of us to learn from what they do. But a couple of tangible examples. Google has probably been the company that has been the leader in bringing a data-centric um, and data-driven approach to everything related to humans and talent. They don't have perfect outcomes, and they by no means have done everything right, um, but they are pioneering exactly what we think will make the difference, which is bringing the same analytical rigor to the decisions that you make around people that we've been bringing to our financial decisions, yeah. our engineering and marketing decisions for a long time already. Perfect. Um, got a couple of questions coming in, and one of them really struck me as I was watching you up on the stage. And I mean, I would see you as a bit of a, a bias buster, just your own persona. So when you think about a Harvard professor, you know, I'm not a professor most, though. You know, but still, you're, I'll take it. <laughs> you're right in there. Um, you know, would this necessarily be the image? And so you are you are creating that role model for for generations to come. But um, how have you personally faced potentially um, unconscious biases as you've 
you know, pioneered in your, in your field of research in, a, in that venerable institution um, and others. Have you faced personal challenges that you'd be willing to share I, with our I audience? I have, and actually yeah. the reason that I do the work that I do is, I would say I've probably been a feminist since the day I was born, but it didn't really hit home for me until I graduated from college and started working. And my first job was in management consulting. And that was the first time that I experienced firsthand bias and differential treatment as a woman. Um, that's not to say that our educational systems are perfect. There's mm -hmm. definitely bias in there too. But I do think by and large the educational system does a better job of treating girls and boys equally than the workplace does. So. I, in our company, we only had 10% of women at the top as partners. I felt like I saw women who were stellar not being promoted, while men who were mediocre got promoted ahead of them. Mm. I was for sure um, underpaid relative to my male peers. And so experiencing all of that firsthand in the workplace as a 22, 23-year-old is what gave me the impetus to say, could I do this work as a career? Yeah. Could this become something that I try to help solve the problem for everybody as what I do full time? And fortunately, that's worked out. <laughs> I think it's worked out quite well. Um, we have a lot of high school students in the, in the audience. And one of the questions is, you know, when you're a student, when you're a high school student, what, what strategies might you suggest that they could undertake to tackle both age and gender bias? That's a really good question. The age bias is a tricky one because, of course, you are the age that you are. Um, I, I saw a question, <coughs> excuse me, flip up there that said, how old are you? <laughs> my, first, my first thought in my head was, would you have asked that of a man? Because I've had older men at work ask me how, how old I am, and I just look at them and I said, that's not a proper question to ask a lady. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I think you have to own own who you are. If you're 18, you're 18. There's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, you have incredible ability to tap into a marketplace that a 30-year-old doesn't or a 50-year-old doesn't. You have insights and you have a way of conceptualizing and understanding the world that a 30-year-old doesn't or a 70-year-old doesn't. So don't try to hide that. I would say bring it forward, amplify the fact um, that your age brings a distinct advantage to many things. In terms of gender bias, I think the strategies are similar um, than they would be in the workplace. Um, things like finding role models for yourself, being a role model to younger people. Mm -hmm. um, I always think of this as kind of a chain, that we're all, all links in a chain. We're beneficiaries of the wisdom and the sponsorship and the advice and help of people who came before us. And it's our job and responsibility to continue the chain and be the next link that passes on that advice, mentorship, sponsorship, advocacy down to other people. So it's never too early to start being a sponsor and a mentor. Excellent. And I think one more question, because I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, but how do you really recognize gender bias, or not gender bias, but unconscious bias when you bump into it? Because I was thinking about this as well, because sometimes it's just in people's best interest to design programs that you know, that, that favor them, right? So there's yeah. a power play, yes. and then sometimes it's just incompetence, you know? That, that gets us there, or the unconscious bias. So when you're, when you're out there and you're experiencing you know, your career, how do you know when you've bumped up against it? Great question. I would answer it in two ways. The first, so the, more, the more systemic level, is this idea of seeing which processes produce outcomes that are differentiated by gender. So whenever there's a gender gap in outcomes, there's most likely a biased process at play. But at the individual level, I think it's really about listening to your gut. Sometimes bias manifests in, in incredibly small and subtle ways. It could be things like you're talking in a group and the guy makes eye contact with the other guys, but not you. Or this is an example that someone told me. They were in an elevator, a woman with a male colleague, and another man joined them, and he shook the man's hand and said, hey, Bob, how's the project going? And then he shook her hand and said, hey, Jane, how's your family doing? Mm. And it wasn't malicious. No ill will was intended. 
but he treated those two people differently purely based on gender. He assumed that the woman would be most interested in talking about her family mm -hmm. and that the man would be more interested in talking about his work. That is a small example of bias. And I think most of us, when we encounter those moments, it's not like the huge red big alarm bell goes off, but there's a little sentiment somewhere in, inside that says, wait, that was kind of off. Mm -hmm. That was kind of weird. Yeah. I used to have guys up come up to me in college all the time, you know, just people that I would be meeting um, as friends, and they would ask me what I majored in. And I told them chemistry and physics. And they looked up and they paused, they looked at me and said, oh, I thought you'd be like French or psychology or something. <laughs> and I never thought about it twice at the time. But of course, now in retrospect, I realize the stereotype of a physics concentrator is not a girl in heels and a skirt. Um, they weren't trying to be mean, but that was nonetheless a very biased thing to say. Um, so when you feel, when you can tell that there's something off and your gut instinct tells you that there's bias at play, listen to it. Pause, reflect, and educate other people in a loving and caring way to say, hey, why did you not think that I am a chemistry concentrator or major? Perfect. Listen, thank you very much. Thank this you. has been fantastic. Big hand for Siri. Thank you. Thank you.